Ricky Ticky Tavi by Rudyard Kipling. This is the story of the great war that Ricky Ticky Tavi fought single handed through the bathrooms of the big bungalow in Sangwali Cantonment. Darzi, the tailor bird, helped him, and Chachundra the muskrat, who never comes out in the middle of the floor but always creeps round by the wall gave him advice but Ricky Ticky did the real fighting he was a mongoose rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits his eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink he could scratch himself anywhere he pleased with any leg front or back that he chose to use he could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle of brush. His war cry as he scuttled to the garden was ricky ticky ticky tick. One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother and carried him, kicking and clucking, down a roadside ditch. He found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it till he lost his senses. When he was revived, he was lying in the hot sun on the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed. And a small boy was saying, Here's a dead mongoose. Let's have a funeral. No, said his mother. Let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead. They took him into the house, and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said, He was not dead but half choked. So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him over a little fire and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, said the big man. He was an Englishman who had just moved into the bungalow. Don't frighten him. We'll see what he'll do. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose because he is eaten from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is run and find out. And Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided that it was not good to eat, ran all around the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself, and jumped on the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said the father. That is his way of making friends. Ouch! He's tickling under my chin, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear, and climbed down to the floor, where he sat rubbing his nose. Good gracious, said Teddy's mother, and that's a wild creature. I suppose he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that, said her husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, He'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely. When it was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. And then he felt better. There are more things to find out about this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and burned it on the end of the big man's cigar. For he climbed up into the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lit. And when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too, but he was a restless companion because he had to get up and attend to every noise all throughout the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in, the last thing, to look at their boy, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy's safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. 
if a snake came into the nursery now, but Teddy's mother wouldn't think of anything so awful. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda riding on Teddy's shoulders and they gave him a banana and some boiled egg. He sat on their laps, one after the other, because every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose someday and to have rooms to run about in. And Ricky Ticky's mother, she used to live in a general's house at Singuli, had carefully told Ricky what to do if he ever came across white men. Then Ricky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated, with bushes as big as summer houses, of Marshall Neal roses, lime and orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thicket of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it. And he scuttled up and down the garden, snuffing here and there, till he heard very sorrowful voices in a thorn bush. It was Darcy, the tailor bird, and his wife. They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up at the edges with fibers, and had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What is the matter? asked Ricky Ticky. We are so miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nog ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad. But I am a stranger here. Who is Nog? Darcy and his wife only cowered down in a nest without answering, for from the thicket grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then inch by inch out of the grass rose up the head and spread hood of Nag, a big black cobra. He was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he lifted one third of himself clear off the ground, he stayed balanced to and fro, exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind. He looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake's eyes that never changed their expression, whatever the snake may be thinking of. Who is Nag? said he. I am Nag, the great god Brahm, put his mark upon all our people. When the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off of Brahm as he slept, look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back of it that looked exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for a minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time. And though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones. And he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nog knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid. Well, said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings out of a nest? Nog was thinking to himself, and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family, but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off his guard. So he dropped his head a little and put it on one side. Let us talk, he said. Behind you! Look behind you! Darcy sang. 
Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him whizzed by the head of Nagina, Nog's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him. He heard her savage hiss as his stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that then was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible lashing return stroke of the cobra. He bit indeed, but he did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darcy, said Nag, lashing up as high as he could reach toward the nest in the thorn bush. But Darcy had built it out of the reach of the snakes, and it only swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a kangaroo, and looked all around him, and chattered with rage. But Nog and Nagina had disappeared into the grass. When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or give any signs of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find they say that when a mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. And that is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongoose's jump, and as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, this makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew he was a young mongoose, and it made him all the more pleased to think he had managed to escape a blow from behind. It gave him confidence in himself, and when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was stooping, something wiggled a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful, I am death. It was Karat, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for choice on the dusty earth, and his bite is as dangerous as a cobra's, but he is so small that nobody thinks of him, and so he does the more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced up on Karat with peculiar rocking, swaying motion that he inherited from his family. It looks very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please. And in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known, he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting Nog. For Karat is so small, and he can turn so quickly, that unless Ricky Ticky bit him so close to the back of his head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or lip. But Ricky Ticky did not know this. His eyes were all red, and he rocked back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. Karat struck out. Ricky Ticky jumped sideways and tried to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head lashed within a fraction of his shoulder, and he had to jump over the body, and the head followed his heels close. Teddy shouted to the house, Oh, look here! Our mongoose is killing a snake! And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick. But by the time he came up, Karat had lunged out once too far. And Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, bitten as high up the back as he could hold, and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Karat and Ricky Ticky was going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of his family at dinner when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose and if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready he must keep himself thin. He went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes while Teddy's father beat the dead Karat. 
What is the use of that? Thought Ricky Ticky. I have settled at all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up from the dust and hugged him, crying that he had saved Teddy from death. And Teddy's father said that he would be a providence. And Teddy looked on with big scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which of course he did not understand. Teddy's mother might just as well have petted Teddy for playing in the dust. Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself. That night at dinner, walking to and fro from the wine glasses on the table, he might have stuffed himself three times over with nice things, but he remembered Nog and Nagina and thought it was very pleasant to be petted and patted by Teddy's mother and to sit on Teddy's shoulder. His eyes would get red from time to time, and he would go off into his long war cry of Ricky Tick Tick Ticky Tick. Teddy carried him off to bed and insisted on Ricky Ticky sleeping under his chin. Ricky Ticky was too well bred to bite or scratch, but as soon as Teddy was asleep, he went off for his nightly walk around the house, and in the dark, he ran up against Chuchandra the muskrat, creeping around by the wall. Chuchundra is a broken-hearted little beast. He whimpers and cheeps all the night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room, but he never gets there. Don't kill me, said Chuchundra, almost weeping. Ricky Ticky, don't kill me. Do you think a snake killer kills muskrats? said Ricky Ticky scornfully. Those who kill snakes get killed by snakes, said Chichandra, more sorrowfully than ever. And how am I to be sure that Nog won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's not the least danger, said Ricky Ticky. But Nog is in the garden, and I know you don't go there. My cousin Chua the rat told me said Chichandra, and then he stopped. Told you what? Shh! Nog is everywhere, Ricky Ticky. You should have talked to Chua in the garden. I didn't. So you must tell me, quick Chichandra, or I'll bite you. Chichandra sat down and cried till tears rolled off his whiskers. I am a very poor man, he sobbed. I never had spirit enough to run into the middle of the room. I mustn't tell you anything. Can't you hear, Ricky Ticky? Ricky Ticky listened. The house was as still as still, but he thought he could just catch the faintest scratch, a noise as faint as that of a wasp walking on a window pane, the dry scratch of a snake's scale on brickwork. That's Nog or Nagina, he thought to himself, and he is crawling into the bathroom sluice. You're right, Chuchandra. I should have talked to Chua. He stole off to Teddy's bathroom, but there was nothing there, and then to Teddy's mother's bathroom. At the bottom of the smooth plaster wall, there was a brick pulled out to make a sluice for the bath water. And as Ricky Ticky stole in by the masonry curb where the bath is put, he heard Nog and Nagina whispering together outside in the moonlight. When the house is emptied of people, said Nagina to her husband, he will have to go away. And the garden will be our own again. Go in quietly. And remember the big man who killed Karat is the first one to and then come out and tell me, and we will hunt for Ricky Ticky together. But are you sure that there is anything to be gained by killing the people? Said Nag. Everything. When there is no people in the bungalow, did we have any mongoose in the garden? So long as the bungalow is empty, we are king and queen of the garden. And remember that as soon as our eggs in the melon bed hatch, as they may tomorrow, our ch-
children will need room and quiet. I had not thought of that, said Nog. I will go, but there is no need that we should hunt for Ricky Ticky afterward. I will kill the big man and his wife and the child if I can and come away quietly. Then the bungalow will be empty and Ricky Tiki will go. Ricky Tiki tingled all over with rage and hatred at this. And then Nog's head came through the sluice and his five feet of cold body followed it. Angry as he was, Ricky Tiki was very frightened as he saw the size of the big cobra. Nog coiled himself up, raised his head and looked into the bathroom in the dark, and Ricky Tiki could see his eyes glitter. Now if I kill him, Nagina will know, and if I fight him on the open floor, the odds are in his favor. What am I to do? said Ricky Tiki Tavi. Nog waved to and fro. Ricky Tiki heard him drinking from the biggest water jar that was used to fill the bath. That is good, said the snake. Now, when Karat was killed, the big man had a stick. He may have that stick still, but when he comes into pain in the morning, he will not have a stick. I shall wait here till he comes. Nakina, do you hear me? I shall wait here in the cool till daytime. There was no answer from outside, so Ricky Tiki knew Nagina had gone away. Nog coiled himself down, coil by coil, round the bowl to the bottom of the water jar, and Ricky Tiki stayed still as death. After an hour, he began to move muscle by muscle toward the jar. Nog was asleep, and Ricky Tiki looked at his big back, wondering which would be the best place for a good hole. If I don't break his back at the first jump, said Ricky, he can still fight. And if he fights, oh Ricky. He looked at the thickness of the neck below the hood, but that was too much for him and a bite near the tail would only make Nog savage. It must be the head, he said at last, the head above the hood, and when I am once there, I must not let go. And then he jumped. The head was lying a little clear of the water jar under the curve of it, and as his teeth met, Ricky Tiki braced his back against the bulge of the red earthenware to hold down the head. This gave him just one second's purchase and he made the most of it. Then he was battered to and fro as a rat is shaken by a dog, and to and fro on the floor, up and down, and round in great circles, but his eyes were red, and he held on as the body cart whipped over the floor, upsetting the tin dipper and the soap dish, and banged against the tin side of the bath. As he held on, he closed his jaws tighter and tighter, for he made sure he would be banged to death and for the honor of his family. He preferred to be found with his teeth locked. He was dizzy, aching, and he felt shaken to pieces when something went off like a thunderclap just behind him. A hot wind knocked him senseless, and red fire singed his fur. The big man had been wakened by the noise and had fired both barrels of a shotgun into Nog just behind the hood. Ricky Tiki held on with his eyes shut, for now he was quite sure he was dead. But the head did not move, and the big man picked him up and said, It's the mongoose again, Alice. The little chap has saved our lives now. And then Teddy's mother came in with a very white face and saw what was left of Nog. And Ricky Tiki dragged himself to Teddy's room and spent half the rest of the night shaking himself tenderly to find out whether he was really broken into 40 pieces as he fancied. 
when morning came, he was very stiff, but well pleased with his doings. Now I have Nagina to settle with, and she will be worse than five nogs. There's no knowing when the eggs she spoke of will hatch. Goodness, I must go see Darzy, he said. Without waiting for breakfast, Ricky Tikki ran to the thorn bush, where Darzy was singing a song of triumph at the top of his voice. The news of Nog's death was all over the garden, for the sweeper had thrown the body into the rubbish heap. Oh, you stupid tuft of feathers, said Ricky Tikki angrily. Is this the time to sing? Nog is dead. Dead. Dead, sang Darzy. The valiant Ricky Tikki caught him by the head and held fast. The big man brought the bang stick, and Nag fell into two pieces. All that is true enough, but where is Nagina? said Ricky Tikki, looking carefully around him. Nagina came to the bathroom sluice and called for Nog. Darzy went on. And Nog came out on the end of a stick. The sweeper picked him up on the end of a stick and threw him upon the rubbish heap. Let us sing about the great, the red-eyed, Ricky Ticky. And Darzy filled his throat and sang, Ooh, if I could get up to your nest, I'd roll your babies out, said Ricky Ticky. You don't know when to do the right thing at the right time. You're safe enough in your nest there, but it's war for me down here. Stop singing a minute, Darcy. For the great, the beautiful Ricky Ticky's sake, I will stop, said Darcy. What is it, O oh killer of the terrible Nog? Where is Nagina for the third time? On the rubbish heap by the stables. Morning for Nog. Great is Ricky Ticky with his white teeth. Bother my white teeth. Have you ever heard of where she keeps her eggs? In the melon bed, on the end, nearest the wall, where the sun strikes nearly all day. She hid them there weeks ago. And never thought you it worth your while to tell me? The end, nearest the wall, you said. Ricky Ticky, you are not going to eat her eggs. Not eat, exactly. No, Darcy. If you have a grain of sense, you will fly off to the stables and pretend your wing is broken and let Nagina chase you away from the bush. I must get to the melon bed, and if I went there now, she'd see me. Darzy was a feathered brain little fellow who could never hold more than one idea at a time in his head. And just because he knew that Nagina's children were born in eggs like his own, he didn't think at first it was fair to kill them. But his wife was a sensible bird, and she knew that a cobra's eggs meant young cobras later on. So she flew off from the nest and left Darzy to keep the babies warm and continued his song about the death of Nog. She fluttered in front of Nagina by the rubbish heap and cried out, Oh, my wing. My wing is broken. The boy in the house threw a stone at me and broke it. Then she fluttered more desperately than ever. Nagina lifted her head and hissed. You warned Ricky Ticky when I would have killed him. Indeed and truly, you've chosen a bad place to be lame in. And she moved toward Darcy's wife, slipping along over the dust. The boy broke it with a stone, shrieked Darcy's wife. Darzy's wife knew better than to do that, 
for a bird who looks at a snake's eyes gets so frightened that she cannot move. Darzee's wife fluttered on, piping sorrowfully and never leaving the ground, and Nagina quickened her pace. Rikki Tikki heard them going up the path from the stables, and he raced for the end of the melon patch near the wall. There, in the warm litter above the melons, very cunningly hidden, he found twenty-five eggs, about the size of a batten's egg, but with whitish skin instead of shell. I was not a day too soon, he said, for he could see the baby cobras curled up inside the skin and he knew that the minute that they were hatched, they could each kill a man or a mongoose. He bit off the tops of the eggs as fast as he could, taking care to crush the young cobras, and turned over the litter from time to time to see whether he had missed any. At last, there was only three eggs left, and Ricky Ticky began to chuckle to himself when he heard Darcy's wife screaming, Ricky Ticky! I led Nagina toward the house, and she's gone into the veranda, and, oh, come quickly, she means killing. Ricky Ticky smashed two eggs and tumbled backward down the melon bed with the third egg in his mouth and scuttled to the veranda as hard as he could put foot to ground. Teddy and his mother and father were there at early breakfast, but Ricky Ticky saw that they were not eating anything. They sat stone still, and their faces were white. Nagina was coiled up on the matting by Teddy's chair, within easy striking distance of Teddy's bare leg, and she was swaying to and fro, singing a song of triumph. Son. She hissed. Stay still. I am not ready yet. Wait a little. Keep very still, all you three. If you move, I strike. And if you do not move, I strike. Oh foolish people who killed my nog. Teddy's eyes were fixed on his father, and all his father could do was whisper, Sit still, Teddy. You mustn't move. Teddy, keep still. Then Ricky Ticky came up and cried, Turn round, Nagina. Turn and fight. All in good time, said she, without moving her eyes. I will settle my account with you presently. Look at your friends, Ricky Dicky. They are all still and white. They are afraid. They dare not move. And if you come a step nearer, I strike. Look at your eggs, said Ricky Dicky in the melon bed near the wall. Go and look, Nagina. The big snake turned half round and saw the egg on the veranda. <sighs> Give it to me, she said. Ricky Ticky put his paws one on each side of the egg and his eyes were blood red. What price for a snake's egg for a young cobra? for a young king cobra, for the last, the very last of the brood. The ants are eating all the others down by the melon bed. Nagina spun clear round, forgetting everything for the sake of the one egg. Ricky Ticky saw Teddy's father shoot out one big hand and catch Teddy by the shoulder and drag him across the table, safe and out of reach of Nagina. Tricked, tricked, tricked. Ricky Ticky Tick, chuckled Ricky Ticky. The boy is safe, and it was I, I, I that caught Nog by the hood last night in the bathroom. Then he began to jump up and down all four feet together, his head close to the floor, 
He threw me to and fro, but he could not shake me off. He was dead before the big man blew him into two. I did it. Ricky tick tick. Come now, Nagina. Come and fight with me. You shall not be a widow long. Nagina saw that she had lost her chance of killing Teddy, and the egg lay between Ricky Ticky's paws. Give me the egg, Ricky Ticky. Give me the last of my eggs, and I will go away and never come back. She said, lowering her hood. Yes, you will go away, and you will never come back. For you will go with the rubbish heap with Nog. Fight, widow. The big man has gone for his gun. Fight. Ricky Tiki was bounding all round Nagina, keeping just out of her reach of her stroke, his little eyes like red hot coals. Nagina gathered herself together and flung out at him. Ricky Tiki jumped up and backward. Again and again she struck, and each time her head came within a whack of the matting of the veranda, and she gathered herself like a watch spring. Then Ricky Tiki danced in a circle to get behind her, and Nagina spun around to keep her head to his head, so that the rustle of her tail on the matting sounded like dry leaves blown along the wind. He had forgotten the egg. It still lay on the veranda, and Nagina came nearer and nearer to it, till at last, while Ricky Tiki was drawing his breath, she caught it in her mouth, turned to the veranda steps, and flew like an arrow down the path with Ricky Tiki behind her. When the cobra runs for her life, she goes like a whiplash flicking across the horse's neck. Ricky Tiki knew that he must catch her or all the trouble would begin again. She headed straight for the long grass by the thorn bush, and as she was running, Ricky Tiki heard Darcy still singing his foolish little song of triumph. But Darcy's wife was wiser. She flew off her nest as Nagina came along and flapped her wings about Nagina's head. If Darzee had helped, they might have turned her, but Nagina only lowered her hood and went on. Still, the instant's delay brought Ricky Tiki up to her, and as she jumped into the rat hole where she and Nog used to live, his little white teeth were clenched on her tail, and he went down with her, and a very few mongooses however wise and old they may be, care to follow a cobra into its hole. It was dark in the hole, and Ricky Tiki never knew when it might open out and give Nagina room to turn and strike at him. He held on, savagely, and stuck out his feet to act as brakes on the dark slope of the hot, moist earth. Then the grass by the mouth of the hole stopped waving, and Darzee said, it is all over with Ricky Ticky. We must sing his death song. Valiant Ricky Ticky is dead, for Nagina will surely kill him underground. So he sang a very mournful song that he made up on the spur of the minute. And just as he got to the most touching part, the grass quivered again, and Ricky Ticky covered with dirt, dragged himself out of the hole leg by leg, licking his whiskers. Darcy stopped. With a little shout, Ricky Ticky shook some of the dust out of his fur and sneezed. It is all over, he said. The widow will never come out again. And the red ants that lived between the grass stems heard him and began to troop down one after the other to see if he had spoken the truth. Ricky Tiki curled himself up in the grass and slept where he was. Slept and slept until it was late in the afternoon, for he had done a hard day's work. Now, he said when he awoke, I will go back to the house. Tell the coppersmith, Darcy, and he will tell the garden that Nagina is dead. The coppersmith is a bird who makes a noise exactly like the beating of a little hammer on a copper pot. And the reason he is always making it is because he is the town crier for every Indian garden and tells all the news to everybody who cares to listen. As Ricky Tiki went up to the path, 
He heard his attention notes like a tiny dinner gong. And then the steady ding-dong, ding-dong, Nag is dead, Nagina is dead, ding-dong-tuck, that set all the birds in the garden singing and the frogs croaking, for Nag and Nagina used to eat frogs as well as little birds. When Ricky Ticky got to the house, Teddy and Teddy's mother, she looked very white still, for she had been fainting. And Teddy's father came out and almost cried over him. And that night, he ate all that was given him till he could eat no more. And he went to bed on Teddy's shoulder. But Teddy's mother saw him when she came to look late at night. He saved all our lives. And Teddy's life, she said to her husband. Just think, he saved all our lives. Ricky Ticky woke up with a jump, for the mongooses are light sleepers. Oh, it's you. He said, what are you bothering for? All the cobras are dead, and if they weren't, I'm here. Ricky Ticky had a night to be proud of himself, but he did not grow up too proud, and he kept that garden as a mongoose should keep it, with tooth and jump and spring and bite, till never a cobra dared show its head inside the walls.